a B-17 by the name of Memphis Bell. I saw it for and left England. <laughs> I arrived in London about July the 1st, and the Mrs. Bell had completed its tour on May the 17th. And the crew of the Bell was there at this welcome center, briefing the incoming crew members on their specialty. Pilots talked to pilots, and gunners talked to the gunners, and we were real proud to head down there to speak to the Americans. It was 1943. Now, on this uh, program topic today, we've got a wide variety. Since I have traveled far and long and flown everywhere, just for your, your <laughs> just for your information, I have been in all 50 of these United States, 74 uh, foreign countries, twice around the world. 12 times across the equator and four times across the Arctic Circle. So I've traveled much. And we have climbed the Great Wall, haven't we? <laughs> I was born in Rolling Fork. Anybody know where that is? But I spent most of my life in Wyoming. And I had four or five different businesses up there, including the whole farm. And for two years, I, ran, I flew a crop duster, dusting cotton. My wife said I had to be a nut to do that. <laughs> uh, folks think that's flying crop duster is dangerous. If you can land an airplane uniform every time, you can dust cotton. What you need is depth perception, see? I started my traveling career in 39. I joined the CCC camps and was sent to Oregon. So the time I was 19, I'd been in 11 states, been to Canada, had seen the Pacific Ocean. And I came back to Mississippi State and I was there when we had that attack on Pearl Harbor. Now, I, I can't tell you everything I know because we've got to get out of here in 30 minutes. But. <laughs> I was at Mississippi State taking some special subjects trying to get ready in one year to pass the entrance test to be an aviation cadet. At that time, you had to have two years of college for passing the test. But after Pearl Harbor, the uh, requirements were reduced to a high school diploma and a test. So I got in a couple months after Pearl Harbor. Now, we're going to get into this main program today. The most famous B-17 bombing raid of them all was the Bombardier Complex at Schweinfurt, Germany. How many of y'all have been to Frankfurt? Just keep on going east from Frankfurt, about 80 or 90 miles, and just a little southeast, and that's where Schweinfurt is. There's a big manufacturing facility there that it's an onset of World War II. They were the world's largest manufacturer and the world's largest exporter of batteries, SKF Corporation. I went back there 40 years after the war as a tourist and visited the site of our bombing raid. This was some of the survivors. And the newspaper man got a hold of me and interviewed me and had my picture served on the front page of a data newspaper man. And I was a combat opponent 40 years ago then, but during those 40 years, the Americans had been helping Germany rebuild and the Russians had not. And it was just 18 miles from Schweinfurt to the East German frontier. And uh, while I was there, my wife was doing some shopping at a department store in Schweinfurt. And she told the sale lady that I was one of the pilots on that bombing raid on Schweinfurt. And this is verbatim now. She said, I remember it distinctly. I was 14 years old. Well, since she was so positive, I thought I'd check her out and ask her what time of the day it was. It was 2.15 in the afternoon. Well, we you should have been there at 10 o'clock at morning. We had ground fog over there in England. We four and a half hours late, you know. 
And I knew that if she knew it, she'd know what time of day it was. So I'm for Germany. Uh, in this uh, combat tour, we uh, I learned the five years that things a Sebring, Florida transition, and had three months more training out in Walla Walla, Washington, and Board Idaho. Last of May, we departed 25 of our crews from Rapid City, South Dakota. What's Rapid City famous for? Mount Rushmore. <laughs> I had been by Mount Rushmore in a B-17 and five times in lighter airplanes, so I'm familiar with Mount Rushmore. Okay, we went to uh, Bank of Maine. Goose Bay. Goose Bay, Labrador. Southern Greenland, Iceland, Prestwick, Scotland, into London. But due to the weather, we spent one extra night at Greenland, four extra nights in Iceland. The airport in Greenland was on an extinct glacier that was a six degree slope. With the sea of measurement way. The entrance to this airport was up a fjord, 30 miles. Your fjord has narrow sea walls. You'd have clouds there. We were briefed there, Goose Bay, that when you go under these clouds, up this fjord, to go to this airport, you were committed to land. No two ways about it, you had to land. Because you didn't have enough power to climb out, you didn't have enough room to turn around. Eh? But they showed us a movie of it, so that gave us confidence. So. <laughs> <laughs> now, taking off from that runway was quite an experience. We were going, the runway's a six degree slope now. We were going downhill on the departure. And as we were getting farther from the surface, you know, getting off the runway, uh, I looked over the rate of climb indicator and said we're going down. Two or three minutes. <laughs> they all were going down. <laughs> Don't many people have that opportunity. I'll tell you another rare thing that happened. When we put a new engine in the B-17 that got shot from there, the crew chief and I had to put two hours flying time on it over England before we resumed combat service. Eh? Well, that's about 10 minutes I got bored. I asked the crew chief to look around and see if he could find enough heavy clothing and two ocean masks. While we were putting this two hours on this B-17, we'd see how high a B-17 would go. I did the 31,000, 30,000 on that. And our bombing range were usually 27,000. So we went to see how high it go. How high do you think we got? 36,100. Wouldn't, wouldn't do it anymore. And guess what happened then? We began to get pain in our knees. We get in the bends. So we went through climbing, so we came on back down. But how many of you folks have ever gotten the bends in your knees? Huh? <laughs> That's a lot of experience, a lot of opportunities. Eh? OK, we got to England finally at Northern Route. And the weather up here is bad for this reason, the northern air comes over the remnants of the Gulf Stream and produces low clouds practically all the time. That's why we're waiting four extra nights in Iceland to go to Scotland. And we, we made that trip under the clouds about 900 feet above the surface. And on that flight, we heard on the radio that a B-26, a Mark B-26, was also on that route. Five minutes after departure, he lost an engine at 900 feet with a lot of extra gas tanks in the bumper and all, all that extra weight. If he had been in 10,000, he'd no sweat, but that load, before they get rid of that extra weight, they went in. <coughs> Can you handle the world that easy? <laughs> We were stationed 80 miles north of London, 
at a little bit of place called Homebrook. Didn't have many, many residents. Had one pub, they call it. Sort of a small general store and a small bar. But just 14 miles from the city of 45,000. Uh, on this Swanford Ray, we had one ribbon going to the target, and these ribbons dodged fortified, fortified areas where they have an aircraft fire. So you would fly over Cologne, you'd just Cologne, so you had a lot of guns. Then just below there was another ribbon, which was our return route. Okay. As a bunch of newbie 17s had more gas tanks stationed south than other than them. They went to Regensburg and bombed an aircraft to send it back in a semi ME 109s. And they briefly said after they bombed this aircraft to send it back, they would presumably land. The deal was they were going to be the first shot of bombing raids in North Africa. They wanted to go to mention it, see, for a day or two. So we didn't notice it, but they were, we were supposed to go in just north of Frankfurt about the same time and dilute the fighter strength. <laughs> that bad ground fault here due to a big high pressure area. We were four and a half hours away from getting off there in Swanford. And these boys in the South and they didn't have quite a bad fog. They got off about an hour, hour and a half late. So they went on to Regensburg and then down. Three and a half hours later, here we come. All those uh, fire planes that they had stirred up had time to reload and rearm, see, and refuel. Okay. Now, let's go back to the briefing now. On the briefing of this thing, they said this target there, Swamp, was the number one target on the list in London of all the targets in Germany. So when we got through the briefing, was going out to the plane, I sent two of the sergeants back to get some more ammunition. We had between eight and nine thousand rounds of ammunition on an airplane. That's fourteen or thirteen machine guns. Okay. <clears throat> on this target being so important, they told us at the briefing that the fifty-five percent of the barriers were made in German were made in Swanford. This, uh, the date of this raid was at the end of a six day period there, and all that good weather, that high pressure area. It had been on a lot of bombing raids. That was my fourth raid in six days. The airplanes and the crews were all tired. A lot of them had a of trouble. So for this Swanson raid, they had what they call an ME, a maximum effort. All the planes and all the crews that they could assemble together go to go on that raid. Well, a group of them had four squadrons of six each. But usually just three went on a raid and give one squadron time to train new crews and train and otherwise rest up, see. But for this maximum effort, we couldn't get but 16 planes in the air that would sure be able to get 20, uh, 25. Out of that 16, two aborted before they got to the end of the coast due to mechanical trouble. So I left 14 of us on that group. And we usually want to have 18 in it for defensive firepower or your machine guns. Out of that 14, nine of us got back. Lost five. Okay. It's about a dozen things about this radio special. I'm trying to think of all of them. Well, I told you about the, uh, oh yeah. After this uh, bunch that went to Regensburg, stirred up all those fighters and didn't come back to them, that really got to look off on their toes. And they knew that on all of these 17s, they could see on radar visually that they were all of these 17s. So before we got there, three hours later, they moved fighters from northern Germany and from Berlin and from Paris area up to Swamp, uh, Frankfurt to wait on us. Okay. 
the group that met the target first, uh, we call the lead group, was below us. We went to high group. We were two or three hundred yards and four or five hundred yards sort of behind the lead group. About 30 or 40 miles before we got to eat with Franklin, this lead group was met by 300 fireplaces. Like a swarm of bees. They'd come in in formation, two and four, and sometimes six at a time, they could hit on tacks. Then after the initial attack, these particular fighters would come back and attack from other angles. So it took a while to get out there and get in position for a second hit on tack. This lead group down here that bore the brunt of all those attacks, they lost all but two. Now, as a pilot, I was busy flying formation, and I, I didn't get to watch much of the action where all the other people was good, see. But I saw one plane that uh, was on fire. The tail got a bail out, and he and his shoot both were on fire. And then the plane blew up. Piece of the wing flopping down, burning gas, ain't time going down, it was bad. Okay, during this first five minutes, when this first group was being decimated, we weren't even under attack yet, see? And I, I got I was sick of all that destruction and death I witnessed, and I told him, go by the fly in a few minutes. I got over it about 10 or 15 seconds, so I, I took back over, but it, it's bad to see all your buddies shout up like that. <laughs> okay, uh, the next 15, 20 minutes, we had the most concentrated fire attacks of the whole war. And I was talking to the crew later, and they said that we had as many attacks on this airplane, on that one raid, and had on the other 24 raids combined. We claimed to shut down three fighters and damaged two more, and we might have done it as hard as Get credit for these fighters. You have conflicting, overlapping claims. But as many fighters that was in the area, I remember we got them. Those fighters had four 30 calibers and two 20 millimeters. But the 20 millimeters don't have much supply of ammunition. So after the second pass, they're out of 20 millimeters. Okay, after we got past the fighter belt, from then on, the next hour, we was harassed, just harassed, by 20-inch and night fighters and 20-inch and light bombers, shooting 37 millimeter cannon and rockets. But they just, they was about three-quarter mile behind. They weren't really a problem. <laughs> okay, those of us that were left went on this bombing range of swine there. The factory there was just about 100 yards from a river. And every time we went on a mountain raid, the Germans had up a smoke screen in an attempt to shield the target, usually just partially affected. But I went to a, a raid at Labour Chase Airport in Paris. It was so good that the only thing you could see was the Eiffel Tower. But this one very effective. And by the curvature of that river, we could locate the uh, factory pretty good. And. Uh, so we, and we were 26 out, you were 27, at that rate of 26. So we dropped our bombs there and swiped it. And on the turn away from the target, going back towards them, if you get on the high fly of a turn on those bombs, high altitude, where you don't have much reserve power, hard to stay in there. So I had learned that, see, it's by 11th raid. So it's, on that turn, I was on the outside. I gave it a lot of control to stay right in there. Had about 73 back there for a while, see? Okay. If any crew member of the bombing crew thinks an hour plane is the one that's being attacked by an incoming fighter, he'll say the word action on the intercom. That's a request of the pilot to take evasive action if it's feasible. We just like got that wing up, heard the word action. Also, about a two or three seconds later, here come a bunch of those 
20 millimeters. They're designed to explode at 1,200 yards. So they want to shoot a pole man, a little gray buckskull, and right around the left one away. About every 40 yards, you see two little gray puffs of smoke. But we missed it. They had the wing up, see? But my navigator, we leave all his life. I read the wing up on purpose. <laughs> Stay in their formation. Now, to just tell you about how important it is to stay in formation, we were coming back to the target there in the Bremen area. This was in December, uh, just a while after I left there last December. We'd been, we'd been receiving a lot of B 24 bombers over there in the last two or three months. When I first got there, it wasn't anything but B 17s. When I left there, we were outnumbered by the B 24s. But they don't fly as high as B 17s. And they can't stand the battle damage as well, the design of the wing and all, and the two tails. But they are faster and carry a lot more bombs than a B-17. Okay, those two tails is part of their trouble, see? In that formation that was flying there and, and passing us going back towards them, I already dropped the bomb. The wing man on this side got too close to his leader. His number one engine chewed up the right vertical stabilizer. So he pulled out of formation a bunch with his number one engine smoking. The plane with the damage stabilizer began to roll and the board rolled, the thrash it rolled, and we saw four shoots come out of it. <coughs> this plane with the smoking engine, before he got back in formation a minute or two later, he got shot out by a mess of it one over nine. Uh, any questions so far before I continue? See, I got to be brief. This I might have left out a lot of stuff. When I got back to the United States, I married a girl at Wichita, Kansas, that I met before the war. <coughs> Stacy, my brother, introduced me to her. At that time, the headquarters of the B-29 program was in Salina, Kansas. So I rode a bus up there to apply to get in the B-29 program. I was fresh back from Europe, January of 44. So they were real nice and they always took my ID and all. Then I asked them for a tour of the B-29. They had a hundred of them there. They declined and said I didn't have a security clearance. <laughs> <laughs> they were all wearing babies like a hell of Hey, my, I married a girl in Wichita, Kansas. How about some questions? You didn't get a purple heart, but almost. When we got this prop shot up there on the third grade, it's Kiel, Germany. A 20 millimeter hit right behind number three engine. Messed up the landing gear. We had to crank the landing gear by hand, down by hand. But a fragment came through that thick glass one that hit me on the shoulder. Now somebody slapped me real hard. But it didn't hurt me, and the plane started to climb suddenly. We found out later that the control cable to the elevator trim tab had been severed. Also, the tail wheel damaged, he wouldn't go down. And uh, me and the co-pilot take turns holding us. We were falling because the plane wouldn't climb. Finally, I noticed a flotation cushion down there, and I put it between. My knee in the control column, that took most of the pressure off that, so the next hour and a half, go back down, there wasn't so much of a strain on us. This, uh, you see the picture over here, it's number four prop on the blades, had a hole about that big, but that's from the end, so it's a different vibration. But I, I didn't feather the prop, because I didn't know when I might lose another engine, so I throttled it down to about 13 inches of manifold pressure to keep it warm, and pull the prop. RPM all the way down and went back to England for two hours there with that bad vibration. I was real lucky that Law really had his arm around my shoulders. Question? I have a question. Who was on there on your plane with you besides the co-pilot? And how many, how many crew did you have on that? What did she say? How many crew members on your plane? 
country bar. It was ten, a crew of ten. Pilot, co-pilot, and in effect, eight gunners. The bumper and navigator both had guns. Pilot, co-pilot, eight gunners. And it works. Have you met up with those? Have you met up with the guys on your in your crew since the war? I left England in '43. In '92, I found out where my navigator was. It was in Portland, Oregon. So I went out there to visit him, and after he introduced me to his wife, I heard her say something about the legend. Don't tell him how many wars. <laughs> <laughs> He's the only one I could find. How many missions did you fly? 25 was a tour if you live through it. If you finish 25 raids, you could come home. It was 25 of us went over there, and this group going by Greenland and Iceland, out of that 25, five of us got back. Mike. Something else that's phenomenal about my record. I got over a thousand four inch hours, about eight hundred twin inch hours, and several thousand single inch hours. All that flying, including combat, I never lost an engine. Wow. Something I'm going to make, just make one comment, and I don't know how many of you know that, but there were more bomber crews killed in World War II than there were Marines. Wow. So the, him, the fact that he completed 25 was a fortunate thing. I can't understand I'll tell you, I'll tell you when it's over. Okay. <laughs> How cold was it up there? How cold? How cold? Yeah. You'd about 25 below. I have seen it 44 below. I'll tell you a quick flying story. In uh, 77, I flew a light plane throughout Central and South America, getting ready for this round the world trip. Going from northern Chile over the Andes to Paraguay. Had to fly with the mouse. This plane that I had then was turbocharged, going 28,000, but it wasn't pressurized. I bought, I traded in a year later on a pressurized drum. Going over the Andes there, as high as I get, 28,000, still in the cloud, with was light above, so I knew it was near the top of the cloud. It began to get a little ice, ice on the leading edge of the wings around. But it wasn't bad, and, 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 and I, Thought we'd be out of the clouds in a few minutes. And in about eight or nine minutes, we did get out of the clouds before the ice got to be critical. The sun was right in front of us. It's early in the morning. That radiant heat from the sun, even though the temperature was 15 below zero, the radiant heat from the sun melted the ice in less than 30 seconds. Wow. Radiant heat. <clears throat> okay. I'll tell you another heating story. <laughs> This class all they said. <laughs> we didn't get any heated flying suits over there until the last two months of my tour over there. Had a place for them, but didn't have the heated flying suit because of the submarine menace. But we got a bunch of these 24s up in Iceland with airborne radar and depth charges and bombs. And starting in July 43, within three months, we had that bunch of submarine menace pretty well subdued. Anyway, we finally got this heated fly suit. <clears throat> okay, the first thing we had to heat the fly suit was in. Uh, when I came in, I had to crank these dogs. I, I just sat down and started doing that, see. I didn't plug in my suit. Anyway, later, as we climbed up higher and getting in those cold formations, when the sun was shining in the cockpit, it'd be warm. But in the shade there, you get cold. So I adjusted the rear stand on my heated fly suit, see. The next cold spell out of just as more. Finally, I decided I, I wasn't getting the heat. I looked down and he didn't plug in. See? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think my time is up. <laughs> Charles, you know, we were at Baptist Church. Talk about the missionaries who carried food to Africa. 
Well, I went to the Baptist Farm Mission Board headquarters at Richmond, Virginia, before the trip. And after talking with them and going to the National Association there, I picked out an itinerary. And I got the names and addresses of all the Baptist missionaries that were located at the other place I would stop. Also, I, I got the name of seven who were on furlough right then. They'd be back at their duty station when I got there two or three or four months later. First, I didn't see you on that time, did I? Okay. Anyway, six of these seven men that I saw later, I met in person before I went on the trip, see? I made trips to my plane to see them. Went to Florida and Texas and Virginia to see these other missionaries. Uh, tell me, tell, yeah, tell what? me what you did with the airplane. Okay, in, in Kenya, I met the pilot there. He had an airplane similar to mine, but it was not as new and it was not pressurized. He said, and it had these extra carry tank. He said, oh, he wish he had that plane there. I said, the next time you come on furlough, you can have it. <laughs> so, a year and a half later, he took it home from there to Tanzania, a station at Arusha in northern Tanzania, about one hour flying time from Nairobi. At that time, in Tanzania, the western two-thirds of Tanzania was undeveloped. Hardly any roads or bridges, the no was paved airstrip. And the missionaries that were stationed in these areas depended on this mission plane and the grass management to get them to and from work and from going to the hospital in Nairobi. Well, in the years following my giving them this pressure out plane, I got letters from two different people in the United States whose relatives had flown in this plane to the hospital in Nairobi. You say we got to play the good baby. Just what you need. You have enough gas to fly from Russia to West Tennessee and into Nairobi without refueling. That's it. I got a ninety-one thousand dollars tax credit. I gave that plane. I don't <laughs> get to <laughs> it.
Okay, I, I'll be around here and I'll hear y'all have everything talk about it. Watch the stuff back here on this TV if I want to look at it and, uh, and join you and grab the attention.